Um, apart from that, before we get into the show, I've been reading this book, right? Murder Machine by Gene Mustaine and Jerry Capici. And it's a fucking frightening book, right? Because, you know why it's frightening? Because I've a, I'm a bit of a sucker for mob dramas. I love um, mob series. Uh, I've watched all the, you know, everything else everyone else watches, like Narcos and El Chapo. Um, I've watched um, Cocaine Cowboys documentary. Um, I watched the Italian TV series called Gomorrah, which is based on um, the Sicilian. Is it Sicilian Mafia? No, uh, the mafia in Napoli, Na- 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 Napolitanesian or Napoleon, Napole- what do you call it, Napolitanesian? Anyway, a gang based in Napoli, in a city, kind of like, it kind of pulled back the curtain on the inner city lives with people that live in Napoli or Italian live in Napoli and kind of, you kind of got to saw how grimy it was. It's not the whole like, you know, Rome, uh, Milan, Venice kind of image of Italy. This is like the real kind of like brass necks, uh, boots to the ground, gypsies, immigrants, all kind of conversing in this like, you know, really dilapidated area of Napoli where it's, it's a bit of a no-go zone for some uh, portions of the police. I've watched all that kind of stuff. I'm starting to watch uh, La Farina, which is on um, Netflix too, which is another Spanish uh, drama, which is based upon the cocaine trade in the 80s, I think off the coast of, uh, where's the place? Fred, not Fred Ventura. Anyway, I forgot the name of it, but uh, there's a coast where most of the drugs was coming in from like Morocco, some of the hashish and that stuff, or some of the coke that was coming in from South America was traveling through uh, southern parts of Africa, traveling its way to Morocco and then finding its way into Europe through that hub. I forgot what the coast is called. Um, but anyway, Alicante, not Alicante, I forgot. Anyway, it doesn't matter what it's called. So I've, I'm into all that sort of stuff, right? And I've got to the point where, um, and obviously series like, you know, linked to drugs, but series like Bodyguard that's on the BBC now, which is fucking amazing. But I'm into all this sort of shit, but... You get sometimes desensitized by a level of violence that was involved in um, securing a drug route or um, for kind of um, establishing a name within uh, the gang culture for uh, showing dominancy or authority for maybe intimidating your opponents, for maybe putting your comrade, your kind of like soldiers in check. You feel, you kind of take for you kind of take for granted the level of violence that's needed in order to keep these guys in checks, right? Because most of these guys are kind of wild men or wild men and women. So some of them may be close to sociopaths, psychopaths. Um, they're kind of on the fringes, right, of society by by and large. And operating on the fringes, you have to do fringy shit to make sure that kind of operation keeps running. But with these dramas and stuff, and even stuff like uh, Sicario kind of did a good, a good, um, did a good job of kind of uh, illustrating the level of violence and brutality that kind of goes hand in hand with the drug trade, especially in parts of Central Southern uh, America. Um, it did a really good job at highlighting it, but you get desensitized from it, right? It doesn't really strike a chord as well as it should do, right? A woman getting her head blown off her shoulders doesn't necessarily uh, take your breath away as much as it should do, right? But the thing about books that is so underrated, which is probably the reason why a lot of people say you should read more books, but I know I don't really succumb to the idea because I think it's a little bit, it's a, li- it's a little bit like intellectual masturbation where people say, oh, people should read more books because what it does is that um, through proxy of just saying it, right, you're virtue signaling because you're indicating to everyone else that you read books and you've gained a lot of value from reading books and now you're preaching to me and telling me I should be reading books. And if there's one thing this society doesn't like anyone doing is preaching. Even if you're preaching on the good side of things, even if you're like promoting women's rights or you're kind of championing the cause of people that are marginalized, uh, minorities and stuff, no one likes someone that's overly preaching about stuff, right? It just comes across a bit dis- ingenuous right um and there's also the idea that you're kind of painting people other people in the corner and you're lifting yourself up on a pulpit no one likes that but i think one of the benefits like again just to kind of extrapolate the whole everyone should read but i think one of the benefits of reading is the imagination right because i remember when you when you were a kid right i know when i was a kid the great thing about being a child is that you entertain yourself with the most mundane of things right i remember when i was little and my mom couldn't afford to buy me a playstation i went into my room and i just made a playstation out of cardboard super sad right someone would maybe use that story um at the beginning of x factor right before they go and sing like a terrible rendition of a uh, boys to men record right and get everyone crying but i think that's what made me that's what made me the person i am today like i went to my room and i got creative and i started making a place out, out of cardboard the whole thing i somehow uh find out the specs of the what the size should be i made i made like a an actual model of a PlayStation using just cardboard. Had the controller, like made like a fake TV, like insane level of creativity. But I just entertained myself for a, for a long time doing that. Um, 
give a kid under five a cardboard box big enough that they can jump in and see how much fun they'll have the rest of the evening right your imagination just is just so free at that time and uh, of that in that period of your life but then the older you get the more responsibilities you have the more expectations um the society places upon you to be a, fu a world functioning adult and the more you have to kind of operate within these different kind of arenas where it requires you to wear a different mask you start to lose um the kind of imagination and you start to kind of like plug into being a bit more pragmatic right uh being a little bit more um close to reality right um being a little bit more clued into what's going around you um and not kind of letting your mind wander so you don't really have that sense of wonder anymore so sometimes when you see things illustrated on tv again and again such as like violence in, in gangs you get this insight from it that doesn't really affect you the same way it doesn't affect you the way it should affect you right so when you read a book and again reading this book um murder machine which kind of details uh the beginnings of the mob in brooklyn right um with like kind of like um with um highlighting kind of the hitmen of the gambino family says here in the back right you start to realize like jesus christ man like these were brutal times like i'm reading a bit now and i'm about quarter, first three quarters of the way through about it or the first quarter of the way through um the book and there's parts of this um book where it details the unrequenting like there was times when you know when some of the most when some of the junior members of the mob who didn't have contacts within the police force uh suspected somebody of maybe snitching or if they got picked up for a speeding ticket but um through chinese whispers the message got back to the crew that this guy got picked up and he was involved in a drug deal gone bad if they got any suspicion that this person might snitch or just kill them and they'll kill anyone connected to them. So they'll kill the mistress that was hanging, that he was hanging around with, who you maybe said too much to. They'll kill maybe the kid who always come to the garage and stay behind after work. They'd kill every single person who they had an inkling, right? Um, might have done something wrong. Now, kill them. They didn't kill them in a very, um, I say, quote unquote, honorable way, right? They took them out in the most brutal way possible. Set them up in a way like I've, there's a story where they set up a girl in a way that she was driving her car and they told her to meet someone outside of a house. One guy pulled up on the driver's side, or no, on the non-driver's side of the window. Another one pulled up on the on the driver's side of the window. The other, the, the other one, so she didn't see the other guy. So the other guy kind of like gets her attention to start talking. As she turns around, another guy comes on the other side where the driver's side window is and shoots on the back of the head two times. Just as if he's coming. Do you know what I mean? Like, one moment you're talking to this guy, and next minute you've got a silencer um, pressed up to the back of your skull, and two shots are going in the back of your cranium before you've even blinked, Right? And then they take this girl's body and they take it to like a, what do you call it? Um, a butcher's and decide, and decide to dismember it because they don't want any evidence getting anywhere. So they cut it up into small pieces, uh, put it into a bag and then split the body. Like take, put it into different cars and then have it split all across um, New Jersey and dumped to different places. So to throw people off. Like insane. Like people just dying again and again. Like the most horror in the most brutal way possible. Like a bomb, someone they, they, they placed a bomb underneath someone's car and it didn't go off as intended. They had to take it off, and taking it off required maybe the person who put the bomb there might his arm might blow off. Like just insane levels of violence, man! Insane levels of violence, and you forget it again. Read these books, but God damn it, man! Especially you thinking it like if they just legalized drugs, right? They'd get rid of all these problems. Maybe it's a bit simplistic to say it, but that might be true, right? They legalized drugs. Because everyone does drugs, right? Everyone from the lowest, from the lowest rungs of society to the quote unquote upper echelons, everyone does recreational drugs. Some people can handle it, some people cannot. But you know, as I think, as grown ups, you should be allowed to do. You should be allowed to partake in as much drugs as you want. And if it if it goes wrong, then it's your responsibility as an adult take responsibility for it, right? Um, it's the same way with the kind of policing of language. I think you know, like um, your your right to offend me shouldn't trump my right to offend you. Like if you say something that's wrong that I don't like, and I switch or we get into a physical altercation, that is what happens when you're an adult, right? You have to kind of run the route, you have to kind of run the risk that you might say something that might upset somebody, but you have to be allowed to say that thing, right? You have to be allowed, we have to live in a society where people can say things, you can't be, oh no, you can't say that, you can't say this, blah, blah, blah. So people should be allowed to take drugs, should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. And what would end up happening was that all these needless lives that are being lost off the back of uh, suspicion that you're going to talk to police or that you're going to say something incriminating, that you're going to get people in trouble and that you're going to maybe bring, bring down this criminal network will be completely gone, right? Completely gone. I'm not sure how you police it. I'm not sure how you tax it and stuff, but come on, man. Let's like, honestly, some of the lives that were lost in this book, like just the first quarter is like, it's so sad. Like, some people were completely innocent, did nothing wrong, were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, or they spoke to the wrong person, or the person that went back and reported it to the gang, didn't, maybe saw something that they, they thought they saw, but they didn't see that. It's, 
Whew, man. So it's a bit of a heavy read. To, it's a bit of a heavy read. Probably not the best thing to read in during the week when you're working or going on your lunch break. I'm, I remember one day over the weekend, I've, like I mentioned previously, I read this before I went to bed and had the one of the worst nightmares I've had in a long time. And I woke up, I was like, shit, why am I having such a bad nightmare? I forgot I had like a nightmare that someone came into our house and like, I don't know, home invaded us. I got beaten up close to death. Like, like it was just a fucking brutal, brutal um, nightmare that I had. And I was like, oh... I fucking read Murder Machine, right? Before I went to sleep. Like, it's not nighttime reading, I guarantee you. Because I remember Tim Ferriss saying the same thing, right? He said you shouldn't read, like, quote-unquote, non-fictional, motivational books before you go to sleep, right? Because it just, like, it fires off every single neuron in your head. You're thinking about uh, ideas and projects and stuff you want to launch and da-da-da-da. You're so anxious, you don't sleep that well. I remember I used to do that quite a lot. I'd be fidgeting a lot in bed, right? And then the brother would not be happy at all. So, um... Don't read motivational books before you go to sleep. And also don't read books about, you know, the, the origins of the Gambino family assassins. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't end well for anybody. So, uh, anyway, I highly recommend it anyway, regardless. Murder Machine by Gene Mustaine and Jerry Capici. It's a, it's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. And if you're a fan of all those mob um, documentaries and series on Netflix and stuff, you'll really, really enjoy it.